I wasn't looking for love, not really. At 28, I was a rising star at my finance firm. Spreadsheets were my love language, and my cubicle felt more like home than any bar or dating app ever could. Then came Sarah's rooftop party. Sarah, my co-worker and best friend, had a knack for dragging me out of my comfort zone. This time, it was a mixed crowd, a bunch of artists and musicians Sarah knew, and a few of the more normal people from the office. That's where I saw him. He was arguing, well, more like playfully sparring, with a guy over the best way to restore a brick building. He was tall and lean, with kind eyes and a mess of dark brown hair that looked like he just ran his fingers through it. He wore a worn leather jacket over a faded t-shirt that probably had a band logo I wouldn't recognize. The opposite of my usual button-down Anslax crowd, but something about him drew me in. So, you think slapping a fresh coat of paint on history is a good idea? He was saying, a playful smile on his face. The other guy, a stocky dude with a shaved head, rolled his eyes. Hey, it preserves the structure, right? Yeah, but it erases the character. The guy in the leather jacket countered. The cracks and the wear, that's what tells the story. I found myself walking closer, drawn to their easy banter. Just then, Sarah appeared beside me, a mischievous glint in her eyes. Amelia, this is Mark, she said, nudging me forward. Mark, this is Amelia, the spreadsheet wizard I was telling you about. Mark turned, his smile widening when he saw me. Spreadsheet wizard, huh? Sounds impressive. It pays the bills, I replied, feeling a blush creep up my cheeks. But I can also hold my own in a conversation that doesn't involve amortization schedules. I winked at Sarah, who snickered. Challenge accepted, Mark said, his voice warm and inviting. So, Amelia the spreadsheet wizard, what do you think about preserving history? We ended up talking for hours, about everything and nothing. He was an architect, passionate about restoring old buildings and giving them new life. I told him about my crazy hours at the firm and the satisfaction of closing a big deal. There were no awkward silences, just a comfortable flow of conversation that felt effortless. As the night wound down, we found ourselves standing by the railing, overlooking the city skyline. The air was cool, and goosebumps prickled my arms. This was fun, I admitted, surprised by the slight tremor in my voice. Yeah, he agreed, his gaze fixed on the glittering cityscape. I, uh, I wouldn't mind doing this again sometime. Me neither, I blurted out, before I could overthink it. We met with Mark's parents, Martha and Arthur, at a fancy restaurant they picked. The conversation flowed easily enough, at first. We talked about the wedding plans, the venue I'd booked, a beautiful old converted library, and the caterer I was stressing over, turns out organic, locally sourced canapes are a pricey business. Then, things took a weird turn. Martha, mid-bite of her lobster bisque, which she pronounced bisky with a forced accent, suddenly fixed me with a steely gaze. So, Amelia, she said, dabbing her lips with a napkin, Mark tells me you work in finance? Yes, I'm a financial analyst at a large firm downtown, I replied, unsure where this was going. Analyst, huh? Sounds important. Arthur chimed in, his voice booming across the table. You must do well for yourself. Mark, who had been mostly quiet up until this point, cleared his throat. Dad, come on. That's not what we're talking about. Just making conversation, son, Arthur said, waving his hand dismissively. He turned back to me. So, Amelia, you mentioned a firm? Big name, I presume? I told him the name of the firm, a global player in the financial world. A satisfied smile spread across Martha's face. Excellent, she declared. And you say you do well for yourself? Investments? Stocks? That kind of thing? Yes, I manage a portfolio, I replied, feeling increasingly uncomfortable. This felt more like an interrogation than a meeting with my future in-laws. A portfolio, huh? Martha leaned forward, her eyes gleaming. How much are we talking about here, dear? My jaw dropped. This was outrageous. 
Nobody, not even family, asked questions like that. I glanced at Mark, hoping he'd step in, but he just avoided my gaze, fiddling with his breadbasket. That's really personal information, Mrs. Miller, I said, forcing a smile. Oh, come on, honey, Martha huffed. We're practically family now. Isn't that right, Mark? Mark mumbled something noncommittal, his cheeks flushed pink. I decided to take matters into my own hands. Look, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Money isn't everything. Mark and I love each other, and that's what matters most. Love is great, sweetheart, Arthur chimed in again. But let's face it, love doesn't pay the bills. I took a deep breath. This dinner was turning into a disaster. Maybe we should stick to talking about the wedding, I suggested, hoping to change the subject. The next morning, I called my grandma. As soon as I hung up with her after recounting the dinner with Mark's parents, a wave of doubt washed over me. Her words, greedy and selfish people, echoed in my head. But I brushed it off. Grandma could be a bit, old-fashioned sometimes. Sure, Martha and Arthur were a little blunt, but they seemed genuinely happy for us. Maybe they were just a bit awkward when it came to expressing their emotions. Fast forward a few months, and wedding planning was in full swing. Everything, from the venue to the flowers, felt like pulling teeth. Whenever money came up, Mark would give a sheepish shrug and say, Work's been a bit tight lately. His parents, bless their hearts, kept offering suggestions, cheaper venues outside the city limits, a family friend who did amazing catering for a discount, discount meaning they'd barter for vegetables from their neighbor's garden. Needless to say, I ended up footing most of the bill. Mark, ever the charmer, would say things like, You're amazing, honey. Handling everything like a champ. But his lack of financial contribution started to grate on me. Finally, the big day arrived. It was beautiful, the weather cooperated, the food was delicious, and most importantly, Mark and I said, I do. The only sour note was Grandma. After the ceremony, she pulled me aside, her wrinkled face etched with concern. Amelia, honey, she said, her voice low. Be careful with those in-laws of yours. They don't have your best interests at heart. I rolled my eyes. Here we go again. Grandma, they're just excited. They love Mark, they love me. Everything's fine. The honeymoon phase was barely over, the leftover wedding cake still sitting on the counter, when the first major in-law incident occurred. It was a Sunday morning, and Mark and I were still luxuriating in bed when a loud thump from downstairs shattered the peaceful silence. We exchanged a confused look, then Mark mumbled. Probably the mail. Wrong. The thump was followed by a cacophony of rustling paper and muffled exclamations. Throwing on robes, we hurried downstairs to find a scene that could have been ripped straight out of a horror movie, well, a horror movie with a lot of floral wrapping paper and gaudy gift bags. Martha and Arthur were sprawled on the living room floor, surrounded by wedding presents, like vultures, picking over a carcass. They were tearing into boxes, ooing and awing over some items, tossing others aside with dismissive grunts. What in the world is going on here? I demanded, my voice laced with disbelief. Martha, mid-unwrap, looked up and flashed a megawatt smile. Amelia, darling. Just admiring your lovely wedding gifts. Admiring? I sputtered. It looks more like you're ransacking the place. Arthur, holding up a crystal vase and squinting at it, snorted. Relax, sweetheart. Just sorting things out. Can't have all this clutter lying around, can we? Clutter? These were gifts, chosen with love, hopefully, by our friends and family. But before I could voice my outrage, Mark spoke up. Maybe they should just leave the presents unopened, right? He said, his voice mild. Exactly. I chimed in, relieved he wasn't completely oblivious. Martha scoffed. Don't be silly, honey. It's rude not to open presents. Besides, she added, her eyes gleaming, we might find something truly special in here. Special for them, that much was clear. 
I watched in growing frustration as they picked through the gifts, setting aside anything that caught their fancy, a silver picture frame, a set of engraved wine glasses, a fancy cheese board. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. These are our wedding gifts, I said, my voice firm. Not yours to take. Look, honey, Martha said, her voice dripping with fake sweetness. We just saw some things that would look lovely in our new house. You know, the one we're redecorating? They were redecorating? With our wedding gifts? The anger bubbled up inside me, threatening to spill over. What about the gift you got us? I asked, my voice tight. Martha paused, her hand hovering over a box wrapped in fancy floral paper. She rummaged through the pile, finally pulling out a small, oddly shaped package. With a flourish, she handed it to me. I unwrapped it slowly, my heart sinking with each layer of tissue paper. Inside was a cheap glass statuette, the kind you'd find at a discount store, adorned with garish plastic flowers. My stomach churned. This was their idea of a wedding gift? Maybe grandma was right. Maybe I'd married into a nightmare. The wedding gift incident was just the tip of the iceberg. Martha's shopping sprees became a regular occurrence. She'd call, all chipper, and ask me to join her for a girl's day out. What it actually meant was me being her unpaid personal shopper. We'd browse stores, and inevitably, Martha would find something absolutely must-have. Then, at checkout, she'd do this weird shuffle with her purchases and mine, muttering about forgetting her wallet and such a hassle with separate bags. Of course, by the time the cashier figured it all out, I'd be stuck paying for both our stuff. Arthur wasn't much better. Weekends were his prime visiting time. He'd waltz in unannounced, plop himself down on the couch, and proceed to spend the entire day, glued to the TV, inhaling whatever snacks I had on hand. When I finally built up the courage to ask him why he spent so much time at our place, he looked at me with a straight face and said, Saves money on groceries and electricity, doesn't it? The audacity of the man. Did he think we were running a charity? Mark, ever the peacekeeper, just rolled his eyes and muttered something about dad just needing some company. The birthday dinner was the final straw. I decided to treat myself, a nice night out at a fancy restaurant, to celebrate another year older, and hopefully wiser. Naturally, I invited Martha and Arthur. Big mistake. The menu was a confusing array of French names and unfamiliar ingredients. Undeterred, Martha and Arthur ordered the most expensive dishes, pronouncing them with a confidence that belied their complete lack of knowledge. Halfway through the meal, Martha declared the escargots too slimy and pushed the plate away. Arthur choked on a mouthful of bouillabaisse, spraying a gout of saffron broth across the table. The entire evening was a disaster. By the time the bill arrived, my blood pressure was through the roof. The cost of that meal could have fed us for a month. And guess who offered to chip in? Nope, not Mark. He just sat there, oblivious, while I choked out a strained thank you to the waiter and reached for my credit card. Back home, fuming and frustrated, I finally confronted Mark. How can you just let your parents walk all over you like that? I demanded. Come on, babe, he said, dismissive. It's not a big deal. They're just, you know, like that. Like what? Selfish and entitled? Mark, this isn't okay. He sighed, running a hand through his hair. Look, I love you, but you gotta pick your battles. My parents are, well, my parents. They're not gonna change. Maybe he was right. Maybe I had been naive, hoping to change them, to somehow mold them into the in-laws I'd always dreamed of. But the reality was staring me in the face, Martha and Arthur were who they were, and that wasn't going to change. The birthday dinner debacle was a turning point but not the end. The in-law gift-giving strategy became painfully clear, shower us with cheap, impersonal trinkets on holidays and expect extravagant presents in return. A framed picture of a lighthouse for Christmas? Try a top-of-the-line espresso machine for Mother's Day, according to Martha's order. Any hint at the unbalanced value of gifts resulted in a lecture about family and not keeping score. My grandma, bless her soul, wouldn't dream of asking for anything. 
Every time I'd inquire about a holiday gift, she'd brush it off with a Honey, I have everything I need. Just come visit, that's all that matters. Meanwhile, Martha and Arthur treated gift-giving like a competitive sport. They'd show up unannounced, a triumphant glint in their eyes, brandishing their latest treasures. A chipped ceramic fruit bowl for Christmas? A set of mismatched oven mitts decorated with faded cartoon cats for Valentine's Day? Each offering felt like a slap in the face. The final insult came on Thanksgiving. This year, I'd opted for a quiet night in, just Mark and me, maybe order some takeout and watch a movie. But of course, Martha and Arthur had other plans. They barged in, laden with shopping bags, their faces plastered with self-satisfied grins. Happy Thanksgiving, sweetie. Martha trilled, thrusting a brightly wrapped package at me. I unwrapped it with a sinking feeling. Inside was a gaudy scarf, the kind you might find at a gas station gift shop. Flowers were fake plastic, the fabric felt like sandpaper against my skin. It's perfect, isn't it? Martha beamed. Matches your new coat perfectly. I forced a smile. The coat in question was a vintage find I'd scored at a thrift store. The scarf, well, it clashed spectacularly. Thanks, Martha. I mumbled, trying to hide my disappointment. Arthur, meanwhile, was holding up a small box. And for you, son, he declared, a little something to help you unwind after a long day at work. Mark's eyes lit up. He eagerly tore into the box, revealing a pack of cheap drugstore cigars. The kind that smelled like dirty ashtrays and regret. Thanks, Dad, he said, a genuine smile spreading across his face. That was it. The final straw. Here I was, staring at a birthday gift that insulted my taste and a husband who seemed more excited about a pack of drugstore cigars than his wife's well-being. The anger simmered inside me, threatening to boil over. But instead of exploding, I did something completely unexpected. I took a deep breath, forced a smile, and thanked them for the lovely gifts. A glimmer of hope arrived in the form of my work performance. I landed a coveted quarterly award, a hefty bonus that practically screamed, celebrate. Venice, with its romantic canals and rich history, had always been a dream destination. Knowing I spoke fluent Italian sealed the deal. This trip, I decided, would be a chance to reconnect with Mark, to escape the suffocating grip of his parents for a while. Except news travels fast, especially bad news to eager ears. Martha and Arthur, upon learning of our travel plans, descended like hungry vultures. Venice, huh? Martha cooed, her eyes gleaming with a disturbing avarice. Sounds delightful. Always wanted to see those gondolas up close. Actually, I said, trying to be polite, this trip is just for Mark and me. A little romantic getaway. Arthur scoffed. Come on, Amelia, don't be selfish. We've never been to Europe, let alone Venice. Think of the pictures. Pictures? This wasn't about a photo op with gondolas, it was about escaping their smothering presence. I'm sorry, I said, my voice firm. But this is a trip for two. My polite refusal triggered a meltdown of epic proportions. They called me selfish, greedy, accused me of trying to alienate Mark from his family. The worst part? Mark, ever the peacekeeper, didn't stand up for me. Instead, he mumbled something about maybe they could come along and it wouldn't be that bad. That's when I knew. This wasn't just about a trip anymore. This was about boundaries, about respect, about whether our marriage could survive his parents' constant intrusion. I looked at Mark, my voice laced with ice. Absolutely not. This is our trip, and they are not invited. The fight that followed was brutal. Harsh words were exchanged, accusations hurled. By the end of it, a heavy silence had settled between us. We retreated to opposite ends of the apartment, a cold war brewing in our once happy home. Days blurred into one another, the silence in the apartment a constant reminder of the chasm that had opened between Mark and me. I didn't call his parents, the mere thought of their entitled whining made my stomach churn. 
Mark remained in his self-imposed exile, the only communication a terse, good morning, mumbled in the kitchen each day. Then, on a random Saturday morning, I woke up to an empty apartment and a sinking feeling in my gut. My phone buzzed on the nightstand, the notification sound grating on my nerves. Glancing at it, my blood ran cold. Airline ticket confirmations. Three of them. To Venice. Purchased from my account. Panic clawed at my throat. No. It couldn't be. But as I scrolled through the confirmations, the sickening truth settled in. Mark, with the audacity of a seasoned thief, had used my trusted access to our bank account to book not only his own ticket to Venice, but two more, for his precious parents. Hotel reservations, also courtesy of my hard-earned money, confirmed my suspicions. He'd gone behind my back, completely disregarded my feelings, and booked a vacation for himself and his leech-like family with my money. The anger, hot and furious, burned away the remnants of any affection I might have had left for him. My fingers flew across the screen, cancelling the return flights and hotel rooms. Next, with a steely resolve, I revoked Mark's access to my bank account. One small act of defiance in the face of their colossal selfishness. A few hours later, my phone erupted with a call. Mark's name flashed on the screen, but I let it go to voicemail. The voicemail notification arrived a moment later, his voice laced with a mixture of panic and fury. Amelia, where the hell are you? We're supposed to be checking into the hotel. What did you do with the tickets? I deleted the message without listening. Then came a barrage of texts from both Mark and Martha. A mixture of demands, accusations, and veiled threats. Mark's final message, though, sent a dark chuckle rippling through me. If you don't give me back access to the account and get us on that damn plane, Amelia, we're done. Consider this your divorce notice. With a newfound clarity, I started making my own plans. I contacted a lawyer, the weight lifting from my shoulders with each step towards independence. Mark's divorce notice might as well have been a gift. I didn't wait for Mark to waltz back in, tail, between his legs. Packing was cathartic. Clothes went into suitcases, knickknacks into boxes. But the gifts from Martha and Arthur, those gaudy trinkets and mismatched sets, I left untouched. I lined them up on the living room floor, a garish monument to their selfishness. A final act of defiance before I slammed the door shut on that chapter of my life. Grandma's house, with its familiar scent of cinnamon rolls and worn furniture, felt like a warm hug. Tears streamed down my face as I recounted the entire ordeal, the hurt and anger spilling out like a dam breaking. Grandma listened patiently, a sad smile on her lips. I told you, honey, she said softly, her voice laced with a hint of I told you so, but mostly concern. But sometimes you gotta learn things the hard way. You know, I said, a newfound determination settling in my voice. Maybe this is a good thing. Now I know what to look for, what to avoid. A few days later, a knock on the door shattered the peaceful afternoon. My heart lurched, but before I could react, Grandma ushered me towards the back room. Peeking through the curtain, I saw Mark standing there, looking lost and dejected. Amelia, please, he pleaded, his voice thick with desperation. Let me explain. Grandma opened the door a crack, her expression unreadable. Mark launched into a groveling apology, spewing words about realizing his mistakes and trying to distance himself from his parents. The anger that had been simmering inside me bubbled over. I barged into the hallway, a cold fury in my eyes. Distance himself? I scoffed. Mark, you were about to spend my money taking them on a vacation. This isn't about you suddenly seeing the light. This is about you being comfortable. Comfortable because I paid the bills and bought your parents' presents. He opened his mouth to protest, but I cut him off. No, Mark. This is over. I don't want to build a life with someone who prioritizes comfort over respect, or someone who lets his parents walk all over him and his wife. I deserve better than that. Mark's face crumpled, but this time, I felt no pity. The door shut with a finality that echoed in the silence that followed. 
Maybe grandma was right. Maybe this wasn't the end. Maybe it was the beginning of something new, something better. A life free of entitled in-laws, a life filled with respect, and maybe, someday, with love that wasn't selfish or convenient.